Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Eduk Show. I am your host, Eduk Jerome. This is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us a like, leave a comment. Let me know how I'm doing because I like bringing this content to you each and every week. My guest is Adele Berté, author of the new memoir, Twist, An American Girl. The book chronicles her formative years as a teenager and young adult as she navigates the minefields of poverty, race, sexuality, and gender during the late 60s and early 70s. Adele is an accomplished musician, a songwriter, and she's recorded and performed for artists such as Culture Club, Whitney Houston, and Thomas Dolby. Adele, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Edric. It's really nice to be here. Thanks. All right. No, you're welcome. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the book. It's a wonderful read. Um, it's such a raw and unflinching look um, at a very important time in your life. What inspired you to write such an honest and open and raw personal story? Well, I'm going to be truthful. <laughs> I mean, I've been working on this book for decades, but um, I have to say when Trump got elected, mm. I saw the writing on the wall and the attacks that were going to be coming towards women, towards gays. I mean, it's not the first time, you know, we've been in this place in America. You know, there was almost a fascist takeover in the 30s. And then with the queer community, you know, we've been on this this uh, merry-go-round before. Um, and I just thought it's so important for us to tell our stories in a very honest and raw way because we are wounded by a lot of the, uh, the systemic uh, oppressions of our society. And unless we tell our stories in a very honest way, those wounds will never heal. And, and I was hoping that by telling my story, it would encourage other people to tell theirs, you know, so that we can kind of understand that all these misconceived divides between us, you know, between gay people and straight people or right and left or black and white and all of it, it's misconceived. We all want the same things. And um, telling stories honestly, I believe is what's going to get us there because we can see, we can be compassionate for each other's uh, wounds and journeys. Hmm. Uh, one thing that struck me when I was reading the book is just the multiple, multiple layers of trauma. Um, there was trauma <laughs> in your family life. There was trauma in the foster care system, the justice system uh, being sexually assaulted. So how are you able to overcome all of these layered on traumas um, and what lessons can you share for someone who might be in a situation like that today? I would say that, you know, uh, and I and I hope this comes through in the book that um, I seized as a child, I really seized on books, poetry and music as a way to uh, almost like life rafts to get me through those traumas. And it did also the goodness in people that I found along mm -hmm. the way. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, my mother was a schizophrenic and she could be incredibly abusive, but she also had an incredible imagination, was extremely creative, loved books, loved music. Um, and I know this is going to sound a little nuts, but it was her affliction that became a blessing for me in a certain sense, because I was able to be fearless in my life and use my imagination and my creativity to get through very dark times and to take risks in my life as an adult mm -hmm. to be able to be an artist and you know a musician and actually make a career of it and a life of it so uh you know i had to come to forgive my mother for the abuse and cherish her for the creative gifts that she gave me and and i would think for anybody going through traumas magical thinking you know it gets a bad <laughs> rap and sometimes magical thinking can get you through the darkest of, you know, foxholes. So um, I would say that uh, don't be afraid to use your imagination um, and to write through what you've been through. And um, yeah, and keep looking for the good in people because there is plenty of it, plenty of it around. Uh, you tell the story through Maddie Twist, who you've described as your avatar. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about Maddie Twist and um, how she's so perceptive and such a keen 
uh, observer of what you were going through uh, during that time. Mm. One of the reasons I, I took on the name of an avatar to tell the story is because I really struggled with telling this story. You know, it's uh, as you said, it's very raw. And Maddie Twist gave me uh, the ability to go into the story inside a Trojan horse of this name, you know, to kind of go back through the, the battlefields of my youth. Um, and it's it's kind of based on, you know, a little bit on Oliver Twist, because the nuns in one of the reformatories <laughs> used to make me stand up and sing the more pitiful Oliver songs uh, for them. You know, of course, I milked it for all it was worth. But <laughs> and then my mother, whose real nickname was Kitty, um, was sometimes called Kitty Twist based on a Jane Fonda movie called Walk on the Wild Side. Mm. Um, so I, I I put those names together. And my Italian grandmother's name really was Maria Maddalena, which is Mary Magdalene in Italian. So, uh, you know, I was able to take those things and create a persona for the kid going through it. You know, not that the story is is not true. All of it is true. But Maddie Twist had the foresight and the kind of forward knowledge of what what happened as she was going through it the act the active voice on the page was very important to bring the reader into the story i i hope you felt that way too i did i did it's very uh it's uh there's no filters and mm -hmm. and you are literally you you feel the emotions and the confusion and everything that that maddie goes through mm -hmm. uh, it comes across definitely through the book um, which leads me to my next question, which is um, you write openly about how you dealt with your sexuality going through that phase, your adolescent phase. And mm -hmm. um, especially during a time when people were literally persecuted for, yeah. for being uh, gay or lesbian in that, during that time. Mm -hmm. But in your book, uh, you write about meeting the holy modelings who yeah. accepted you and mm -hmm. validated you at a very critical time. Yes. Uh, tell me about the Holy Modlins and the impact they had on you as a person and as a queer artist. Right. Well, I was fortunate enough to, when I was emancipated from, from Blossom Hill, to get an apartment. Well, it was in a duplex, at, uh, and I lived beneath um, a troupe of performing drag queens. And, of course, I was like a little boy in those days, and they adopted me, and I became their drag king you know, part of their family. And it was uh, an extraordinary time because we could be ourselves when we were with each other, you know, at home and uh, having parties and whatnot, or in the gay bar where we performed and where we could celebrate each other. But in real life, um, yes, we were totally persecuted. And if you were discovered as being gay or queer in those days, you could literally lose your life. And the character I write about, um, Mona, was very closeted. And she had a straight boyfriend and ended up being murdered several years oh, after wow. the closing of the book. But hmm. um, And I nearly lost my eyesight, you know, when, when I had a foster sister beat right. up after having been discovered uh, as, as uh, having a girlfriend in junior high school. So it you know it was a very very different time and I think I think young queer people need to understand the history of of us and what we fought for and what we went through in those days too. There aren't I don't think there are enough queer stories about that time um that tell tell what we went through, you know. Um I wish there were more. That was one of the obligations of the story as well is to 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 bring those stor that story forward of what gay people went through back in the 60s and 70s. Um, you also write about uh, racism, um, the racism expressed by your own family members, mm -hmm. uh, but yet your own experiences uh, with Black music and Black culture gave you um, an entirely different perspective from your family. So right. can you speak to how your experiences shaped uh, your view of race, uh, particularly the impact that Black music had on you and your views? Sure. Uh, my mother was not racist at all. She was kind of the opposite. She had so much empathy and compassion for what was going on during the civil rights movement. Uh, the Italian side of the family was severely racist. And that system systemically had everything to do with 
them being the underdogs and, you know, the Italians. And then, well, we found another underdog. Now we can pick on, you know, black people, which was just, it was so absurd. And having, I was the white anomaly in Blossom mm. Hill because it was about 90% black girls. And I had never really physically been around black people. And it was very obvious they hadn't been around white people either. And because I could sing and dance, I was accepted. And um, black music and black culture had so much of an influence on me for so long, at long after that period as well, um, because I went to Trinidad and Tobago a lot in my life. And I have like a second family there. But um, having been the anomaly, um, uh, like, singing gospel music was revelatory for me. Mm. It was incredible what, how I felt singing in concert with other voices. Gospel music raised the hair on the back of my neck. And it taught me um, something that I still hold is true, that God is music. God is sound. And sound can work miracles. I mean, they're now discovering how sound affects matter in a very physical way. And that uh, if you play songs for people that are suffering from Alzheimer's, if you play songs from their youth, they know every word, they will sing along to it. So, you know, it's such an interesting thing. Um, we're so stuck in genres, you know, like everybody has to be in these kind of little boxes today uh, in terms of sexuality and race and and all of it and it, it it's kind of a capitalist way of like making sure that we're we're all you know very defined so they know how to sell to us <laughs> yeah <laughs> but exactly. um yeah but black culture I, I i'm absolutely enthralled to this day I, it's it's so much a part of my dna my grandmother grew up playing stride piano too mm. and um and she played piano in in speakeasies during the depression which was a very dangerous thing for a woman to do at that time, a single woman. She raised my mother, you know, while playing piano. Um, so it's, you know, it's in my blood. It's, it's bone deep. Um, are you still in touch with members of your family? I know you've changed some of the names and things like that, but uh, if you are, what's been their reaction to the book? Well, most of my family is gone. It's a very long story, but the man I thought was my father that I write about was not my biological father. Interesting. Um, and I had to separate from that side of the family because they are racists. And I, you know, my chosen family is from Trinidad and Tobago and they're black and I was not having it. I couldn't I couldn't deal with it. So I don't really uh, talk to 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 family. I don't have family, so to speak. My family is my chosen family, really. Um, let's shift gears now and talk about your career. You've written songs and performed, as I mentioned in the opening, uh, with a variety of bands. Uh, what are some of your favorite memories of writing and performing music? And who are some of the folks you really like to uh, perform with? Well, I loved performing with uh, Thomas Dolby. We were going to talk about him because... Um, uh, and I want to share this with you. Uh, okay. I collect vinyl records, as you can see. Yeah. And uh, this oh, is Hyperactive, which I hope you can see. And yeah. you are actually on this record, which I did not know until I started doing the research. So oh. uh, I was a huge Thomas Dolby fan. That yeah. 80s English funk, him, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of folks were coming out of the 80s and uh, out of England at the time. So anyway, major fan of Thomas Dolby. So please, mm -hmm. yeah, tell me about Thomas Dolby. Well, uh, you know, Thomas, uh, he produced my first single when I was signed to Geffen Records. It was called Build Me a Bridge, and it was a dance record. It was also kind of a pop song, but but what happened was the guy at Geffen, the A&R man, took the tapes away and had them remixed without Thomas knowing about it. Hmm. He flipped out. So he wouldn't produce my album because he didn't want to work with the guys at Geffen. But he loved my voice so much that he said, come over to England and work with me on the Flat Earth, on that Flat mm -hmm. Earth album. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I went to London and we had a ball. He was recording at um, Eel Pie Studios, which was Pete Townsend of The Who's studio. 
And that studio has a glass wall that's right on the lip of the Thames River. It's such a gorgeous studio. And uh, Tom would pick me up. I'd meet him in Hammersmith and we would take a boat down the Thames. He had a little <laughs> rowboat that we'd take down the Thames to the studio. It was just a very enchanted uh, working relationship. Uh, we really got along well. And he asked me to do a duet with him on Hyperactive. And to both of our credit, um, he that was his second biggest hit next to She Blinded Me With Science. So I really enjoyed working with Thomas. I, I enjoyed working with every, every uh, British artist, you know, Tears for Fears. We were on tour for nine months. Hmm. It was a very long tour for Sowing the Seeds of Love. And we performed in front of 20,000 people in Brazil, opening for Bob Dylan. I mean, wow. you know, to be on a stage and looking out at that big of an audience in a stadium was just magic. So there were a lot of uh, wonderful memories. Yeah. And as I said that, um, you know, Thomas Dolby and people like that also bringing it back, you know, black music, black funk. Mm -hmm. um, he was, he worked with George Clinton. I mean, there, there yeah. was, there's all these connections that always seem to go back to soul and funk and rhythm and blues. Yes. And um, so like I say, when I saw you work with Thomas Dolby, it was like, wow, you know, cause uh, I was a, t a, a teenager during those years and, Mm -hmm. that music started coming in because funk was kind of dying out and over here. Mm -hmm. But in England, you had Howard Jones and you had all these folks who were, who were making funk music. And so I kind of mm -hmm. latched on to Thomas Dolby. So thank right. you for sharing that story because he's, yeah. uh, he's one of my favorite artists as well. Yeah. Um, are you still writing, performing? Uh, do you still get to scratch that, that creative itch? I do. And I'm, I'm slowly reapproaching coming out with music, a song at a time. Like for instance, I wrote a song called American Elegy that's now it's up on Spotify. It's very political. Um, and the next record is coming out. The next song is coming out um, at the end of this month. It's called Savage is the Wolf. And it's coming out on Bill Col Coleman's label, Peace Biscuit. Hmm. Uh, it's a dance label primarily. He's he's worked with everyone from Grace Jones to Ultranate to uh, Sia. And, you know, they've they've done a lot of remixes and uh, it's it's for primarily for the dance floor. There's going to be a lot of uh, dance mixes of it. And hopefully it'll be playing, you know, on dance floors this summer. Um, so that'll be on Spotify, I believe, at the end of this month. So, you know, come one song at a time and then possibly starting to perform again in the late summer. Um, nice. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Nice. Uh, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the other book you wrote. Uh, you wrote, you've written a couple of books mm -hmm. uh, about LaBelle and the yes. book, Why LaBelle Matters. So yes. tell me about that book and why LaBelle is such an important cultural touchstone uh, in music history. Well, I saw LaBelle, gosh, I think it was 1974 or 75 when they first came out with the Nightbirds, Nightbirds record, and they did a show in Cleveland. And it was at around the same time that David Bowie was doing his whole theatrical mm -hmm. Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars shows. And um, I I first heard LaBelle on the Laura Nero LP, Gonna Take a Miracle, um, which was an extraordinary LP. And the vo their voices together was just magic. Um, I discovered them in, I, I guess, when I was around 18 and went to see their show. And it was as theatrical as the Bowie show. Um, uh, Nona Hendrix came down from the ceiling in a <laughs> silver space suit and Patty had on wings and a silver. I mean, they were just glorious. And um, the music was a combination of political, punk, funk you know, rock and roll, all of it. It was very outrageous. And they were speaking to women's power, to to black women's power. And it, it was just amazing. I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I thought, oh, wow, th this is completely changing the paradigm of the girl group, you mm. know, the traditional girl group from the 1960s. And uh, I, I just thought it was so important to write about them, write a little book about them, because... Whenever I would say LaBelle to anyone, they would automatically say, Patty LaBelle, Patty LaBelle. It's like, yes, but you need to know who LaBelle were, the three women 
you know, the super group. Um, and uh, they, they kind of were lost in history for a moment there. Now they're being recognized. A lot of writers are starting to write about the group. Um, but at the time that I wanted to write the book, you could hardly find any references about them. One of the biggest hits of all time in any genre was Lady Marmalade, which yes. was just an amazing song. I was a kid when it came out, but that song, I remember everybody singing that song and yeah. trying to sing in French or whatever, you know, trying to figure yes. out those words. Yeah. But uh, I remember my my parents, they had parties and so forth. And that song was played yeah. all the time and it's still played all the time. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. they were very important, very important group. Well, uh, we're just about out of time. But uh, let me ask now if people want to get more information about you uh, mm -hmm. or get a copy of the book, uh, where can they go? Well, to buy the book, you would go to uh, bookshop.org which is a great place online to buy books, but it should be in all of the major chains, Barnes and Nobles, but also the, you know, the local smaller independent bookstores should be carrying it. Um, uh, they should also have the LaBelle book. And if anybody's interested in why LaBelle matters um, and information on, and on myself, uh, www.adelberte.com, but I'm also on Instagram and Facebook as my own name. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Adele, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking to me today. I really appreciate uh, the book. It's such a, a unflinching view, and I think people can read it and know that they don't have to struggle alone. Uh, that's what yes. I took from it, that that there are folks out there who, as you mentioned earlier, can help you and can mm -hmm. relate to you. And uh, because we are in a period of time where it does feel like we're kind of going backwards in some areas and so your book is quite timely, uh, as especially young people deal with things like poverty and race and sexuality. So thank you for writing the book and sharing such a personal story. Oh, thank you so much, Edric. I really appreciate speaking with you today. It's been wonderful. Thanks. You're very welcome. This has been another edition of The Edric Show. My guest has been Adele Berté, author of the new memoir, Twist, An American Girl, which is available everywhere. Uh, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. And again, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. I want to thank you for tuning in and we will catch you on the next episode.